stand up. And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, will there be enough space in my aunt's apartment for aromatherapy candles that don't immediately cause a hazard? And with billionaire fashion tycoon Yusuka Maizawa going into space, what sort of one-piece space suit fashion will he be showing off? And now, the podcast host who can't wait to hit the slopes in his new bodysuit, Pete Dominic. Oh, I can't wait to hit the slopes wearing just about anything. I wear a gorilla costume at this point. Very excited to hit the slopes. Thank you, Pete Go, and thank you all of you for tuning in today. Got an awesome episode of the podcast. Aaron David Miller joins me to talk about the Democracy Summit that President Biden is hosting and more foreign policy expert Aaron David Miller of the Kennedy Endowment. Carnegie Endowment, rather. I don't know what the Kennedy Endowment is, but I'm sure it's really important. He joins me second at about an hour and eight minutes into the podcast. And also joining me today, the great Wajahat Ali. It's Wajahat Wednesdays, everybody. We start our chat about 27 minutes in. Really fun, funny, thoughtful, thought-provoking conversation with the Waj coming up as well. But before that, I've got about a 25-minute news recap. And tomorrow on the show, Liz Winstead, comedian and activist Liz Winstead and Robert Jones who is the author of The End of White Christian America and White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Fascinating guest tomorrow. But I want to get to today. A lot to talk about in the news, so I think we should do it. Should we do it? Let's get to it. Time for the last 24. Today's news is brought to you by GiveWell, GiveWell GiveWell.org. If you want your charitable donations to save more lives, go to GiveWell.org slash stand up right now. All right. What stories are you paying attention to? What are the most impactful stories in your local area, in your life, in the world? Always want to hear from you. I'm watching and looking at the last 24 hours of news. And I'm thinking a lot about that Joe Biden Vladimir Putin phone call, which, by the way, be in prepping for talking to Aaron David Miller. I watched a panel that he moderated between two experts on foreign policy, specifically authoritarianism and democracy. And it's fascinating. But one of the points that was made is that Vladimir Putin has always been someone who has invested in and supported countries and specifically certain organizations in in countries that are pro white dude pro straight white guy anti gay kind of racist i mean you can look and see his own ideology and where they spend money and it's it's a really fascinating and important thing and then you see the reverse of that you see Tucker Carlson Donald Trump and others running interference for Putin like hey what's wrong with Putin he seems like a great guy why are we worried about what he does on his borders that's none of our business that's a really important nexus i think to to look at and discuss and something i've been thinking and reading about but here is yesterday uh, Jake Sullivan president Joe Biden's national security advisor uh, and no nonsense in in a in a briefing, not giving us much to work with uh, at, as to what happened in that two hour phone call. But here he is, nonetheless, being asked a very strange question: Is the world safer after the phone call than it was before the phone call? Okay. Is the world safer today after that conversation between the two leaders, or less safe? And then I have a follow up as to your answer. So all I will say is that. Um, The ultimate metric for whether the world is safer or not is facts on the ground and actions taken, in this case, by Russia. Let's see. We are prepared to deal with any contingency, as I said at the outset, and I'm not going to make predictions or characterizations. I'm only going to say that that President Biden will continue to do all of the necessary prudent planning for a variety of different pathways that can unfold. I don't know if he said this next clip before or after, but here he is uh, characterizing the phone call between Biden and Putin. President Biden was direct and straightforward with President Putin, as he always is. He reiterated America's support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
He told President Putin directly that if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States and our European allies would respond with strong economic measures. We would provide additional defensive materiel to the Ukrainians above and beyond that which we are already providing. And we would fortify our NATO allies on the eastern flank with additional capabilities in response to such an escalation. He also told President Putin there's another option, de-escalation and diplomacy. The United States and our European allies would engage in a discussion that covers larger strategic issues, including our strategic concerns with Russia and Russia's strategic concerns. Uh, concerns, I think you said. I think I cut him off there. Jake Sullivan, President Biden's national security advisor. And here is the president's spokeswoman, Jen Psaki, on the same issue. Is there any room, as the effort is to de-escalate, is there any more room for the president to maybe have another conversation, another direct conversation with Putin on this and efforts as we seem like we're at the 11th hour? Sure. I mean, in April, I will say that the president certainly values leader to leader diplomacy, as you've seen evidence of over the course of the last several weeks. What they agreed to at the end of the call, that would that there would be close coordination and discussion uh, at national the, the level of senior national security staff. That's the next natural step here. It's really up to President Putin to determine uh, what the path forward will look like. So I don't have any calls to predict or preview at this point in time. OK, so after the summit, there was a hearing at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which was interesting. I grabbed audio from this, did a good job on this one today. Senator Bob Menendez, Democrat of New Jersey, was, I think, chairing it or at least asking questions to the witness who is State Department official Victoria Newland. Again, this is following President Biden's call with Vladimir Putin, Russia appearing to uh, prepare to invade Ukraine. And here's just a back and forth. Do we have a calculus as to um, how much pain uh, Putin is willing to uh, subject uh, himself to in order to invade Ukraine, meaning how many uh, lives as Russia's uh, sons uh, are uh, in in the mix in terms of uh, particularly a, a long term uh, insurgency that would exist by the Ukrainian people rising up. Uh, Chairman, I thought you sent President Putin a very powerful message yourself this morning that the Ukrainians are a tough nation. Uh, they will not stand by should President Putin order his forces into Ukraine or otherwise try to destabilize their democracy in profound ways. I think the Russians will have a very big fight on their hands, uh, that there will be severe casualties for them. And frankly, it's uh, hard to comprehend why, why at a time when Russia itself has one of the highest rates of COVID around the world, and the Russian people are suffering in other ways. Putin would want to spend the money in the Russian treasury, uh, hundreds of millions of rubles, on a war nobody needs with Ukraine, rather than on building back better inside Russia, which is what his people are asking for. Would it be fair to say that because of the uh, mounting Russian troops, which I understand is like close to 170,000 or so amassed along uh, Ukraine's uh, various borders, that, in fact, it has caused the Ukrainians to have to mobilize in a way that they might not have before? That's right. With, as I said, uh, close to 100,000 troops now and, and many, many more planned, the Ukrainians are having to think differently about their own security. And in fact, some of the defensive lethal support that the U.S. has given Ukraine over the, the years they've had in storage containers, and I think we'll now see them have to put that stuff out and, and uh, be thinking very hard about their, their own civil defense. Okay, that's Victoria Newland from the State Department, the Foreign Relations Committee, yesterday in Washington. Then last night on Fox News, Tucker Carlson shamed and criticized Republicans, Senator uh, Todd, uh, Roger Wicker and Jody Ernst for opposing Russia and supporting Ukraine. And it was uh, it was very it was real bizarre. And he, he certainly does simplify things for his audience uh, it makes him very binary, and he's v real effective at it, which is why he scares the hell out of people and dominates in the ratings. 
All right, let me change gears to another important story that came out of Washington yesterday. There was a protest outside the U.S. Capitol to demand that Senate Democratic leaders ignore their chamber's parliamentarian and include a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants in the reconciliation spending bill or undocumented immigrants. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and some other progressive lawmakers joined a group of protesters outside the U.S. Capitol. We just lived through one, almost two years now of a pandemic that relied, where our country relied on undocumented people to survive. Okay, we're going to put it down really simple because who else was sanitizing our buildings? Who else was caring for our elders? Who else was harvesting our food? Who else was stocking our shelves except immigrant labor in the United States of America. We will not be a country that says we will take that and, yes, exploit that and not accept the basic quality of all people. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez went on to demand that the Senate step up and override the parliamentarian and include immigration reform in the reconciliation spending bill. The Senate needs to step up, override the parliamentarian. Okay, the parliamentarian is not elected. It is not an elected position. And the parliamentarian has been overridden and dismissed in the past. We will not surrender our power to an unelected parliamentarian. We need to use our power to help the people. And so the Senate Our demand is for the Senate to override the parliamentarian, include a full path to citizenship. Okay, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with about 150 protesters outside the Capitol yesterday, and we'll see what happens with that. Also want to mention House uh, approved a $760 billion defense bill. Despite some discord among Democrats, the House passed a finalized version of the defense bill late last night with overwhelming majority support, moving legislation now to the Senate and President Biden is expected to sign it. And this will go under the radar, but it's no small thing. And there's a lot of details here. And I'm sure like uh, an outlet like Democracy Now! is doing good reporting on that tomorrow, digging through what's in it, what's not in it. I read one article about it. Wish I could summarize it, but I got to move on to the next story, but I may get back to that and dig deeper with a guest. Very important and highly recommend you dig into the what was in this 700, almost 800 billion dollar defense authorization bill. All right. So yesterday, Jen Psaki really messed up when she took a question from an NPR reporter about making testing easier and potentially sending tests to the American people. And Jake Tapper had Peter Hotez on yesterday, Dr. Hotez on to discuss this. And Jen Psaki, I, I got and the administration getting rightfully criticized. I'm not sure how you can see this. I I, uh, I agree with Hotez in this, and I think the vast majority of experts, when it comes to making things easier, and I, I love the way that Hotez says this, and uh, Tapper's got it all in context for us. Here's CNN's Jay Tapper with Dr. Peter Hotez. When asked why testing at home kits are not free and available to every American, why not just make them free and give them out to, and have them available everywhere? Should we just send one to every American? Maybe. Then, then, what, ha- then what happens if, you, if every American has one test? How much does that cost? And then what happens after that? To Saki's response, Rick Bright, um, Trump's ousted vaccine director and former Obama advisor on the matter, tweeted, quote, actually stunned by this response. Adding extra insurance barriers isn't the answer. Yes, mail them to all Americans. What do you think, Dr. Hotez? Is it really that crazy an idea to talk about mailing tests uh, for COVID to every American? Well, well, I think Jen Psaki's a a fabulous press secretary, but that was not her her best moment. Uh, You know, in in fairness, um, you know, she hasn't been given a lot to work with. I think the current plan makes no sense as far as I can see that we're going to ask consumers to buy it on their own and then try to get it out of the insurance companies. We've learned, Jake, one thing among the things we've learned over the last two years is our health system when it comes to COVID-19 can tolerate zero complexity. The minute we make things the least bit fussy, it totally breaks down because in the end, we don't have a health system 
like the UK or Western European countries or Israel or even, you know, Canada. We just have a very depleted health system and it doesn't work. So here's what has to happen. It, we've got to, we, we don't have to make it free, but anyone should be able to walk into a CVS or Rite Aid or a local pharmacy and for a couple of bucks at a subsidized rate, get a home test so they can do home testing. We have to make things super easy breezy if we want Americans to get tested and so and and that's where that's where we need to aspire to go and it shouldn't be that hard we've never fixed testing in this country we've never fixed testing in this country and her uh, Jen Psaki's flip response was roundly criticized and I I can't uh, disagree with that myself all right now I want to head over to the economic effects or what's going on with markets I saw this clip and I thought it was interesting because over on CNBC the, the vice chair of Blackstone, a guy named Byron Wynn, he really gushed about the strength of the current economy and predicted it's going to withstand the threat of the recession due to the Omicron variant. He's on Tuesday morning, CNBC Squawk on the Street with host Carl Quintanilla. And I have been ageist lately talking about uh, when certain politicians are over a certain age, maybe it's time for them to to, to retire. I mean, this guy, Byron Wynn, from Blackstone's like 400 years old. I got no problem with him looking at the markets and the economy and, 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 and reading the tea leaves and then going on TV and talking about it. Fine. Guy must have a pretty good track record if he's 400 years old and he's at such a high ranking job at such a prestigious firm. Listen, the earnings outlook has improved. The economy is extremely strong and the fourth quarter earnings could be up 18%. That may be reflected in the price of the S&P getting above 4500 And then the old coot went on to say Omicron's not slowing us down either. We're on fire. I know that uh, Omicron is going to have an impact on the economy, but the economy is so powerful now. Um, you know, it's, it's almost every parameter you look at. If you You know, I know the employment report was a little disappointing, but unemployment is 4.2 percent. There are no layoffs. Uh, uh, house prices are going up. Uh, people feel very secure about their jobs. The quit ratio is high. Uh, so every parameter you look at, uh, from employment to capital spending to small business indicators, purchasing manager indicators for goods, uh, indicate the economy is roaring ahead. So we're going to have real GDP very strong in the first quarter. In the fourth quarter, maybe slower in the first quarter because of COVID. Uh, but I, I think I don't think we, a recession is imminent. There you go. Wow. How about it? What do you think of that guy and his predictions about the economy? And right there at the end of that segment, by the way, he went down for his nappy poo. And I thought it was super weird because he was right. He was on CNBC and he just lied down like an old Wilbur Ross looking fella. <laughs> All right. Well, they are still arguing about build back better. And Chuck Schumer was on the Senate floor trying to tamp down the argument that has been been being made by its critics on the right that. Passing it would blow inflation all out of the water. Well, here is Chuck Schumer. Economists across the ideological spectrum have said it will not, will not worsen inflation. Something we are seeing happening across the world, not just in the U.S. Here's something just about every American can appreciate. Build Back Better will make it cheaper for parents to raise their kids. For that alone, it's more than worth the effort. By providing the largest investment in child care in American history, Build Back Better will make it so the vast majority of families will pay no more than 7% of their income on child care for kids under six. That single investment could save parents hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year. I think it's a pretty good, big, great deal for American families. It will also help our economy. Everywhere you go, you hear about shortages of labor. One of the main reasons is inadequate child care. We rank way low on the list of the, of the developed nations. The United States' provisions of child care come out near the very bottom. 
Yeah, I wanted to play that because I think that's actually pretty good economic analysis from the Senate Majority Leader, old Chucky Schumes, Amy Schumer's cousin. That's right, for real. Okay, so now it's time for me to get to everything else I've got for you. That's all the sound I've got uh, for today's news. But now there's a whole bunch more headlines I just want to mention, as always. You know, I'm going through this stuff off and on all day. I'm listening to stuff. I'm following the news. And some of it I get sound for. Some of it I just want to mention and, and, and let you know about as I give you the best news recap using so many different sources you can find on any daily podcast. Right? Okay, let's do it. Time for the news dump. Hit it, Pete Co. Invasive hippo swimming free, the scientists in a huff, dirtying the water with their feces on today's news dump. Oh, dear. Yeah, those are that's a real story. The, the South American hippos that Pablo Escobar bought have now gone crazy and, and become an invasive, invasive species. I don't know about the, the whole feces thing, though. OK, Pete, thank you, as always, pal. At Pete Co. V.O., by the way. And stay tuned for the end of the show. I keep forgetting to throw this in. Longtime listener Barry Hummel does a podcast with his daughter, Abigail, and Pete Co. did a little voiceover for them, and I'll throw that in at the end of the podcast. Don't let me forget to do that, Keith. Keith, imaginary producer? Okay, just me and Indy in the shed. Hit the music, Indy. All right, what have I have? What have I have for you? What have I have for you? Hawaii governor has declared a state of emergency warns of disaster occurrence from, from heavy rains. I keep talking about Hawaii's weather, but heavy winter storms have been hammering Hawaii for the past few days. The National Weather Service warned of possible catastrophic flooding there. Do we have anybody listening in Hawaii? Can we get a dispatch? Are you okay? Can I come stay with you when this is over? And I thought this was an interesting story. A coalition of dozens of U.S. electrical utilities on Tuesday announced plans to collaborate on a charging network for electrical vehicles with the goal of charging ports along all major U.S. travel corridors by 2023. That is awesome. The National Electric Highway Coalition uh, comprises whatever. Uh, Read about it. That's a very important story. Apparently, Elon Musk thinks this is a stupid idea because his charging ports only work for Teslas and he doesn't want competition. I think I read that yesterday. Is that right? The state of Montana is pushing to end federal protections for some grizzly bears. Conservationists argue doing so will result in overhunting of the species. Montana officials petitioning to remove protections for grizzly bears in northern continental divide recovery zone. The governor said populations in the region have surpassed recovery goals outlined by the state. Hunting grizzly bears is banned in the continental U.S. Wildlife advocates speaking out against the move, arguing the removal of protections would result in overhunting of the species and say it's absurd to declare grizzlies, quote, recovered as a pretext for allowing people to kill them with little oversight. Comment from the senior attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. All right, what's next? How about this story? George Orwell's estate has approved of a retelling of 1984 from a woman's point of view. Orwell's classic gets a feminist perspective in Julia by American author Sandra Newman. This is a very interesting story. How about that? Uh, Comedian Dave Chappelle is going to be opening the Netflix Comedy Festival next year. I guess they don't care about the uh, the controversy, despite waves of criticism that he received in his final special on the streaming platform. He's now going to headline the show Dave Chappelle and Friends at the Hollywood Bowl venue on April 28th, the first day of the Netflix is a Joke Comedy Festival, which runs until May 8th and features more than 130 comedians and performers. Tokyo has announced it plans to recognize same-sex marriage starting next year. Japan's capital plans to create a system that will recognize same-sex marriage in the next fiscal year, according to Reuters. Wow, I did not know that same-sex marriage wasn't legal in Japan. I feel like a real dum-dum right now. A major Amazon web services outage caused issues far beyond Amazon Tuesday. Problems with the cloud computing servers caused failures or slowdowns for large parts of the Internet, according to The Verge. Services that reported issues after the outage began around 11 a.m. Eastern included Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Slack, Venmo, Spotify, Tinder, and cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase. Man, that's why my entire morning was ruined. And finally, cream cheese shortage affecting New York City bagel shops. 
supply chain problems that have hit businesses across the country now threaten the quintessential New York treat. I have had enough. I'm just kidding. We'll deal with it. We'll adapt. Previous generations got by. We're figuring it out. I'm not suffering yet. Are you? With the supply chain problems, where have they really hurt your bottom line? I mean, maybe maybe they have. Now I feel flipping bad. But actually, let me know. How's it going in your business, in your community? Let me know. What are you finding? What are you needing? How's it hurting what you're trying to get done with your work, with your life? I'd, I'd love to know. I didn't mean to be flip, but it is the end of the news dump. All right, two excellent guests joining me on today's show. Aaron David Miller coming up. Before that, I've got Wajahat Ali. But just a reminder that now is the time to give. And the best place to give is GiveWell. GiveWell.org slash stand up is the exact link. If you haven't gone over there yet, please, now is the time. Give it a shot. Look into what they do because donating money is a uh, wonderful and selfless act. And so many of you have been so generous over the past couple of years that I've been working with this organization on this campaign. And if you want to make sure that your donations are improving or saving lives effectively, go to givewell.org. You'll get a short vetted list of best charities they found at saving or improving lives per dollar. They do the research. Thousands of donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. And right now, if you're a first-time donor, they will match your donation up to $250. So go to GiveWell.org slash standup. GiveWell.org slash standup before the end of the year and do it now. All right. Well, one of my favorite guests to have on the show and I try to get him on Wednesdays so we can have a branding issue. Other than that, it's really no specific reason. Also, we've written, uh, Gareth Sever, listener, has written an amazing jingle for Wajahat Ali. He is now over at the Daily Beast where he writes a column and he's got an uh, excellent new book, which I promise I'm going to finish this month called Go Back to Where You Came From and Other Helpful Recommendations on How to Become American on Sale now and you can get it in in january check that out follow him on twitter of course at wajahat ali it's time to go hit the music he's wajahat ali got a book he comes out the 25th of january go back to where you came from do you mean where he got his name from lego abilities amaze until his wife stops his spending spree he'll dismantle your political stance on his own call in his jacket shirt and tie in his underpants his powers of thoughtful discussion bring new one's perspective that can help but draw us in it's wednesday i'm a Raja. Yeah, it's, it's actually really good. I mean, it's like a catchy jingle. It works. <laughs> it really I'm not just saying that because it make me, makes me sound so dope. And it's like the first soundtrack I've ever had. But it's actually really good. It, it really, really is. It's like, but it's longer than the opening to Silver Spoons. Speaking of Ricky Schroeder, big fan. What Did you know that Ricky Schroeder would turn to the dark side? When yeah, being... I, I, yeah, I interviewed him at Sirius. And he was there to promote some veterans benefit. And I was always good for a, a veterans uh, uh, issue, organization benefit. I did a lot of work with veterans. And so I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up watching him on Silver Spoons. And he, I thought he was good on that uh, NYPD. Yeah. And then uh, he came in. But yeah, he had a not physically a twitch. But, you know, when someone's like, oh, this guy's gone. Like he said some weird shit to me on the way to the elevator. Oh, really? Yeah, just like some weird right wing, like, you know, Patriot bullshit. You know, it's like, oh, man, this dude's really out there. Yeah, you, you, can, you can always tell there's like an unrest in the eyes and like a radicalization that yeah. happens slowly. But surely it's very interesting how it happens to some of these Hollywood folks. Like you think they'd probably turn on the maybe it's because they feel rejected from the community that embrace them. And like it's like a scorned son who then has to go far right because they go hard. Right. Like we like remember. uh uh, who was the guy who was like the lame, the, the guy, gosh, he's not, Zena's dope. The, the lame dude, Sorbo. What's oh, his name? yeah, uh, Hercules, uh, Kevin yeah. Sorbo. I interviewed him too. Was he a freak also? Yeah, yeah. He is. He and his wife came in and they were real Christian-like. Like, it's fine to be Christian, but why do you have to be a freak? That's like, No, yeah. no, the, not the good kind of Christian. Yeah, 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 the nutty. And then I remember I had a crush on Buffy, the first Buffy, and this is for you old timers. It was not Sarah Michelle Gellar, who we also had a crush on. The first Buffy was Christy Swanson. In the movie version starring her and the late, great Luke Perry, 
Uh, and then she also turned out to be hardcore nuts. And she was anti vaxxer And of course, she got COVID. Ah. Uh, Too bad for her. How do you feel about that? Like that guy, Marcus Lamb, who was proselytizing anti vaccine and used ivermectin and then he got COVID and died at a. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Thoughts and, thoughts and prayers. He has returned. He has returned home. Yeah. And on. I'm, I mean, I don't like to be, look, I, I don't take joy, let me put it this way, in all seriousness, I don't take joy in anyone's death, I don't, I don't sit there and like applaud, it's sad, uh, but it's a preventable death, number one, and furthermore, the privilege that he had and the platform that he had, he used to mislead millions of people, and we don't have the data on this, but I'm just going to bet, as a betting man, that other people took his word and yeah. took a dewormer instead of a vaccine that saves lives, and they probably also got sick and died. Yep. And so to quote Batman at the end of Batman Begins, I don't have to kill you, but I don't have to save you either. Right. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love that you quoted Batman. I really like that. You know, I've been thinking about you, Waj, since last week when Lauren Boebert did that killer stand-up clip, and I kept th- saying to myself, I was thinking about Muslims, but then I was thinking about, like, funny Muslims, that I know, and a lot of the Muslims I know are funny because I met them through doing comedy. So like Mezun Zaid or Dino Bedal or whatever, I was like, I bet you Waj, I bet you Waj has something. But so my question is, have you ever just like put on a backpack with nothing in it and just gotten on elevators with the whites just to mess with us? You know, the funny thing is, in, in a world where we didn't like, you know, where we didn't fetishize guns and like people like Lauren Bobart, who I'm convinced would love. Like, I'm convinced she gets hard off of, like, seeing gun pictures. Like, that's yeah, what yeah, gets yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's whap yeah. for her. Uh, and, like, you know, this might be too blunt, but I, she's a freak. Like, I, I feel like yeah. she'd make love to every gun she could. Yes. So when you have, like, an open carry Lauren Bubart and, like, freaks like this, uh, you know, in all seriousness, that I, I would be the one to do that joke. Like, can say psych. But at the end of the psych, I'd be a chalk line. And I'll give you a quick example. Two quick examples. I was in New York. <laughs> Like years after, no, like line. years, yeah, I'd, be, I'd just be a chalk line. Like that's Wajat Ali. And like, you could see some of the chalk line on the, the, <laughs> the elevator floor. And then you could see some of the chalk line uh, on the seven button. Uh, that was a piece of watch there. Um, I remember I was in New York and you know how sometimes you go to like an event. It's it's like I had a carry on and I need a, just some place to like check the bag. So go to a hotel. I'm like, listen, I got a speech. This is my carry-on bag. I'll give you 10 bucks. Can you give me like, you know, a ticket with the concierge? The guy looks at me and goes, there's not a bomb in it, is there? I'm like, are you serious? He goes, I got to ask. We go to, we go to uh, Netherlands. It's me, two brown dudes. We're there for some conference. Professors at Duke. And we, this is our hotel, right? And so we had to check in like at 12. We got there a little bit early. So we're like, we don't want to sit here and wait. Let's just give it, we'll give you our bags. And we'll go, we'll come back at one. The lady looks at us and goes, are there any bombs in the bags? And I'm like, are you serious? She goes, yes. I'm like, this is, uh, yes, this is what we do. We bring bombs to the hotel that we're staying at. She goes, are you serious? She goes, no, of course not. There's no bombs. We're here for a conference. And I kind of, you know, my personality, I think like yours is you take the wise ass approach. I don't get too angry, but I'm telling you, man, these two guys who I was with, who are these very spiritual academic types were just so angry. Yeah. And if and if we literally then confronted them in this day and age uh, and there was a Lauren Bubart or a Kyle Rittenhouse or a McCloskey, what would happen to a guy like me? I had to stand my ground because this goddamn darky was uh, he was joking about bringing bombs in his suitcase. I had a legitimate question. I asked this darky. It's a legitimate question. And he got aggressive. I had to take my gun and shoot this darky down. And then he'd probably get like his two cousins who would like vouch for him and like the police officer, just like we saw in with uh, the Emma Arbery case, you know, the friggin' prosecutor yeah. had worked with the, one of the killers, uh, you know, it'd be like that. So you ask Those me a very guys, simple question, that's the answer. I'm working on like a joke. I wish, I, I don't think I could do it. Cause like not everybody pays such close attention to a trial, but like those guys, the uh, McMichael, whatever the, that killed Ahmad Arbery were such redneck looking guys. I just want to do a joke where like, I'm a jury member and they walk into the court and I'm just like, guilty. <laughs> just look at that face. He is <laughs> guilty of killing a black kid from his pickup truck. Yes. No need for any arguments or witnesses that red beard. <laughs> I, I see his racist bone. It's shining. The racist <laughs> bone is shining. 
He's like, like Terry is like, damn it. I tried Grace's to hide the shine. Is his femur. <laughs> yeah, his femur. You know, that's the reality, man. That's this is the post 9-11 reality for many Muslims or those people who look Muslim because it's not it's not just Muslims. I want the right the listeners, you know, because people say I'm, I think about I'm thinking about doing this piece for Medium called Fuck Them Muslims. That's going to be the title uh, of the piece. And and there's going to be like just kind of tongue in cheek. Fuck them Muslims. Right. Like it's the last bipartisan uh, refuge for Islamophobes, so whether you're liberal or you're conservative, especially post 9-11, the war on terror. And I think people don't realize that the effect of this casual normalization of anti-Muslim bigotry mm. has a profound impact on your fellow citizens. Many of them who are, wait for it, innocent Muslim women, mothers, children who wear the hijab, and also poor sick men and women who aren't even Muslim. First hate crime after 9-11 was a sick guy, sick, yeah. Balbir Singh, a couple of days later in Mesa, Arizona, not even in New York, and the white supremacist, and by the way, these racists are not the most nuanced folks. <laughs> Uh, shot and killed this poor immigrant gas station owner because he said, your people brought down the towers. Yeah. So there's a real, there. I mean, you asked me a very simple question and I, I wish in a perfect world I could be like Steve Martin and Roxanne and rattle off 20 insults at a bar and like have the last well, laugh. I, but I, no, but I, get, I, oh. I think that, I think that it's, what what she said, what Lauren Bobert said in the backpack and the Muslim thing, and and, and hearing Ilhan Omar speak about it at at a you know press conference, and then this this weekend she was on State of the Union with Jay Tapper, yeah, Tappers. and yeah. and um, it was really that was heart wrenching to watch. So yeah. so we can joke about it, and we are, and I wanted to joke about it with you, but like it's easy to move on when it doesn't affect you, when it's not you, and it's not your kids, they don't look like you. But but it's it's it probably was a little bit more of a <clears throat> for you and your family it was probably a little deeper impact this week than it was for me and my family. I was hurt like a six out of ten, so it bothered me for two days. But it bothered you like a ten out of ten for like the rest of the week and time in your life because I can just move back on and 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 mix in with the insurgents. Yeah, you you could be a moderate white or even insurgent white, and you'll get a press conference from the traitor tots or who I call the Goldie Glocks. Yes, uh, the, the fascist five. Yes, read uh, read all of <laughs> read all of Wajahat, uh Daily Beast articles, and then also I suggest listening to them. The, the DailyBeast dot com has this function where you can listen. However, the AI person they have that sounds like a real person has not bothered to learn to pronounce your name. Yeah, which is hilarious, right? Like Wajahat Ali. Well, this week's article on the fascist Horrible. five. It's like yeah. it's like Wajihu. <laughs> like yeah. what? <laughs> Warbalot Molly. <laughs> what you would call it? Warbalot. I thought it was really weird when it called you Ellie Mistal. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like Maz Jabrani. and like <laughs> you, can, you can hear like the you can hear the record uh, the the freaking audio fiction in the background. It's calling you, you go, that's not that's not Maz. That's Dino Beta Love. Like, right. <laughs> it's just an, a racist or lazy. AI. It's like, is it a Persian? It doesn't matter. Yeah, we, we, I had a joke about this yesterday because some like troll is like, have you ever seen May this is a true story? Like troll's like, I've never seen Mehdi Hassan and Wajahat Ali in the same room. <laughs> and, 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 and I quote tweeted it and I'm like, Yeah, I'm like, we are the same person. We're also Ali Velshi and Anand Giridardas well, and Hari Kondabolu. I like that kind of racism. I think that's funny. We have to respond with humor, right? Like Mel Brooks came out with a book, which I'm trying to interview Mel Brooks. I actually had interviewed him once before. It was oh, like, really? Yeah, I interviewed him for Al Jazeera America. And the way I got, that was like my, you know how you have a list? I'm sure we've talked about this before. You have like a list of interview subjects, like your top 10, right? Oh, so yeah, Mel for Brooks, sure. since high school, I was like, I got to get this guy to high school. I don't know why. And then I'm like, I got to get this guy to Berkeley. So in Al Jazeera America, when I was co-hosting, Max came. Max is his son. Who yeah, I know Max. Z. And I was telling everyone at Al Jazeera, I'm like, zombies are going to be huge. It's going to get us ratings on this network that gets no ratings. And Max is a smart guy. Everyone thought it was shit. We brought Max. He flew in because he just respected Al Jazeera and the, and, the, and, the, and the work that we're doing. That was our highest rated show. I stayed in touch with Max. I'm like, yo, I would love to get your, your dad. And I kept, he goes, just keep sending me emails. So I kept bothering him. And then one day, I can't believe I told you the story. One day, Max sends me this email late at night. Who's opened this email? I opened this email. It's like a, 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 a AVI file. I opened the AVI file. It's Mel Brooks staring at me, and he goes, "Al Jazeera, fine, I'll do it." And then two weeks later, 
we do a 30 minute like just segment with all uh, with Mel Brooks and I just make the guy laugh a couple of times. Where is it? Uh well Al Jazeera uh, being that uh freaking shit show of a network it was based on the the contract that we interpreted and or received Come on. from Gore. They have like nothing. They have nothing. Come on, it doesn't it, it's not you don't have a file? Nope. And the file was like then after I left, they like they took the file, but it was like a really smart 30 minute show. And the reason oh, I mentioned dude. Mel Brooks is because Mel Brooks, as a young Jewish guy, refused to back down to anti-Semitism. So yeah, he was irascible and witty, but he's like, I'm gonna fight back. And he said, if you can neuter and laugh at the fascist, you rob them of their power. And I feel like humor used wisely is a way for us to respond and fight back. You know, yeah. sometimes humor is necessary <clears throat> to really engage with these this darkness, yeah. this yes. racism. No, this no, evil. no. Like, dude, listen, if uh, I'll be your friend the rest of your life. And if I ever see you losing your your edge in your humor, I mean, I just read your recent Daily Beast columns, which have it. Your book is is filled with it. And uh, I mean, I'll just come down there and punch you in the goddamn face. <laughs> I mean, you have to. It's exactly what you just said. I mean, Mel Brooks. I mean, there, there's so many. Uh, Victor Frankel, I think, talked oh, yeah. talk about. I mean, you know, so. So, by the way, do you ever talk to Jonathan Greenblatt? Uh, once in a while, yeah. We we text and we we message Good. once in a while. One of the most powerful things I ever saw was you and him presented on stage to young people at Aspen. That was amazing. And, and you remember that? That was last second. They literally paired me with Jonathan, yep. and they're like, it's young like, folks. It was like it was, the two of you had, had tag-teamed like, your whole careers. The, the chemistry was preposterous. I thought you guys might have hooked up earlier or something. No, no, no. We, that, that was before. Uh, I think that was, <laughs> or maybe it was the like Sabbath. So it was Jonathan, Aspen. Yeah. Aspen, yeah. whatever uh, state, whatever that happens. Was, that, that was literally, they paired me and Jonathan. It was the first time I'm meeting him. I'm like, yo, what are we going to do? I came up with an idea. And he goes, okay. He goes, Let, just run with it. And he ran with it. Yep. And we kind of just tag teamed and the kids were engaging with us. And we asked the kids to yell out the worst thing they've been called. Remember that? And they oh, just shouted all the terrible things. And then we tried to like see that, like the strength and powers and how you denuder it and how you like booby trap it and you fight back. And it was really good because you, you were moderating it. And I thought you, you had the best gig. Because for Aspen, for those of you who don't know, Aspen is called, I'm not making this up, Billionaire's Mountain. It's where rich people go to get away from rich people. It's like it's like where the filthy F you, it's, it's like there's so much money. It's not F you, it's like F me. Like <laughs> That's how rich it is. Uh, and, and it's very white. And Aspen Ideas is a great festival. It's been nice to us, but it's very white. And then so Pete was moderating the section where they brought all these kids from all across the country. And that's where you had like the most diversity, the most youth. And I thought like, I don't know, man, I thought that had the best vibe of the entire Aspen Ideas Festival. No doubt about it, because, uh, you know, you, you're around young people who show promise. It's so much more inspiring than being around a bunch of old people, even if they're prominent, you know, diplomats or scholars or academics. It's just is a different vibe. Jonathan Greenblatt, by the way, is a director of the uh, Anti-Defamation League. So a Muslim and a Jew on stage doing a bit together as if they'd been working together on the road in the Catskills for a generation was pretty impressive. Uh, do you... Can, can, I, I, can, I, can, can I share this Petraeus story with you, Ruka? I've never shared the story publicly. About a Aspen? 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 I, I've never, I was going to write in a book, but I'll just share it on your podcast. All right. So we're at Aspen. <laughs> Thanks for saying Because so literally, so, when I shared the story, people are like, that needs to go in a book. And I put it in the first, the book that you're reading, Hopefully still reading Pete because Pete hasn't finished this book. I gave it to him like months ago. He was one of the first people to receive it, but I'm not bitter. It was in the first draft. But I had to cut it for length. So so this is Petraeus, right? General Petraeus, a man who was in charge of like our military and Central Asian strategy, spent time in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then kind of, you know, got humiliated through this uh, scandal with his mistress and, you know, uh, had giving access to information. And at that time, it was like the first year of the Trump administration. And he was angling. It was very clear. He was angling for a job, so he's holding his punches. It was very disappointing. He was on a panel with Julia Yaffe and Dave Throtkoff, and David and Julia were like saying all the smart things, warning about what was going to happen, and you would expect Petraeus to come in, but he didn't say anything. So Petraeus is like lumbering around. I see him, like this man just walking around. And he goes, I'm looking for the Facebook tent. And you know how I am. I'm not intimidated by anyone. If you want me to meet like anybody, I'll, I'll, I'll be your wingman. I'll be, I'll be your goose. So my friend who works at DHS, who was with me, is Afghan American. He goes, "Oh, it's Petraeus. You know, I'm at DHS. I'd like to meet him." I'm like, "Sure, Petraeus." So I go up to him like I'm his best friend, introduce him, introduce myself, Horace. He literally stares at me, cranes his neck left and right, looking at us, and then goes, "I spend time in Pakistan. I miss the melodious accent of the people." And Horace, who's Afghan, takes a piss out of me and goes, 
Wajahat's first language was Urdu. He has a beautiful accent. And I'm like, ah, it's okay. I don't want to. Wajahat, do the accent for Petraeus. And then Petraeus <laughs> brains his neck slowly towards me, eyes widening, and just like waits for it. And so then I do this bit of a, like an aggrieved Pakistani uncle in Karachi <laughs> who, who, who takes the piss out of U.S. military in the war on terror and talks about how they like caused more chaos than what they did. I just did this bit. And he sits there smiling. And he turns his neck and then goes to my Afghan-American friend and says, and you are? He says, a- a- Afghan-American. He goes, can you do the accent? And I'm like, Horace, my friend, was a refugee. Do the accent. He speaks the language. Horace, go for it. And Horace, his face gets ready. He goes, I, I-, I, for- I forgot. I-, I have to go now. So then we use humor since we're so used to it. We internalize this. And we're like, that was wild. And we share this story. We thought people would laugh. And I remember there were folks from the Atlantic, the magazine. Yeah. I told them their face dropped and they were just like your face right now. Yeah, They're yeah. like, holy shit, that's Be- terrible. Because because that whole scene out there is a whole listen. Mitchell show. <clears throat> I know that you love Jeff Goldberg. I love Jeff Goldberg, the editor in chief of the Atlantic. But Aspen is is <clears throat> in in many parts his. He kind of right. I mean, like, there's this billionaire out there. Uh what's her name? The lady from the fortune for the pomegranate. Oh, yeah. Freakish. <laughs> Yeah, I, I went to her house. Yeah, I, did remember. you go to her house? Well, because there were Jeff had his anniversary party, yeah. so he he invited me to the house. And I'm like, this place is absurd. Yeah, so they have a house. They have a lake. Uh, they have a they have a. Um, I thought this was crazy. I, did you? I don't know if you noticed this, but they had uh, like a their own clouds. <laughs> and really? I thought it was crazy. They had these people that moved clouds in and out of. So I was at that party. All Mexicans too. They were Mexicans moving clouds yeah. to and yeah. fro. Mexicans Cum- can do anything in this country. Cumulus crowds. They really can. And I I literally, I was at the cocktail party. I remember feeling anxious because I didn't have somebody to talk to. And I literally physically bumped into three people. Petraeus, McChrystal, and Callista Gingrich. <laughs> and then uh, I actually was so aroused at that trio, I, I didn't I didn't think I could top it and left. So my, I'll do a one up on that. So Jeff was one of the people who heard the story and he was just like, wow, man, that's terrible. Uh, but I was giving unsolicited advice to Sally Yates at the time. And Sally Yates, if you remember, got fired for not implementing the illegal Muslim ban. She was the attorney general. And Sally Yates, by the way, look, look how an awkward person I am. I think my awkwardness saves me. I go up to Sally Yates. Who am I? I'm nobody. And I say, you have the most excellent posture I've ever seen. This is remarkable. And she goes, yes, I've been told that. He goes, I slouch. I don't know how you do it. First thing I've ever said to this woman I've ever met in my life, uh, you know, Sally Yates, <laughs> like, who's a hero at this time, right? And then I say, Sally, you need to write a book. She goes, I've been thinking about it, but who am I? I'm like, your story is, and your journey is very inspirational. So that she like leans in, goes, what would I write about? I'm giving her these tips. Guess who just comes in and just, it was like a gin. A gin just came in from the clouds. The Mexicans lowered her down. And the the crowd parted. Barbara Streisand yeah. just comes in <clears throat> somehow, like yeah. like goes through me like like T one thousand liquid metal. Yeah, takes Sally Yates and whisks her away. And yeah. I'm like, this place is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then I, later at that night, you and me performed comedy in the weirdest stand up comedy act it, uh, like club that you and I have ever performed at. Well, I did it every year there for maybe five years, and that that night in the audience there were more billionaires than than any other year, and it was. Streisand and Michael Eisner, Michael Eisner. And, and others. Yeah. Yeah. And then we bombed. All of us bombed. Trayvon bombed. Uh, I was 50 50. You were pretty good. And then they took him two hours to get drunk. And then they finally laughed for Michael Che and Colin Joseph at the end. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was exactly. Maz killed, I think. Was that the year that Maz was? No, there? no, 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 no. That, Ma- that was the year where like everyone just died. And Maz Jabrani did a joke about um, one of the funniest jokes ever. He said, what? <laughs> he said, uh, they lost their little girl in, in, in Aspen, downtown Aspen, at the little playground. They couldn't find their little girl. And, and Maz had this this terrible pang that any parent feels when they can't find their kid. And then all of a sudden he was soothed by the idea that if she's going to get kidnapped in Aspen, she'll have a better life. <laughs> That's a fantastic joke. Maybe it's better. It's like that movie, Go- uh, not Gone Girl, it's like uh, Gone Baby Gone. It's like the Ben Affleck movie. Right? I never saw like, that movie. Oh, hey. yeah, yeah. It's, it's like similar. We're like Morgan Freeman. There's an elderly couple and they, they're the ones who end up kidnapping like this girl. And like they're like, she'll have a better life than us. And Casey Affleck's like, no, it's wrong. And at the end of the movie, they, he brings her back to her, his mom who's like a deadbeat. And then you're kind of like, oh, maybe 
<laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. spoilers. So maybe so Maz probably is like, you know, maybe maybe we should call off the the hunt. Do you do you know Maz? I know my Maz is I just sat for his podcast last week and Maz is going to be joining me for the LA book launch. So Maz is going to oh, be Oh, great. I want you both then to join me on this podcast because the three I I I adore like he and I are in love. And, and you're too bald men too, so your child yeah, yeah. would either be bald or yeah. be really hairy, like two extremes. Yeah, well, I would never I would never marry him. <clears throat> um I would marry his wife though. She's great. And then do you know Tim Wise? I know Tim. Uh, we've only been on an MSNBC segment once together. All right. Well, I want to have you on with him, too. And uh, also, Jared H. Sexton keeps wanting to get the, ba- the the band back together. So I should mention that. I feel bad for Jared because I feel like I, I, I read his tweets and Jared's like, Jared reminds me of like me, like in the sense I always joke that if I was in a born movie, I'd be the guy in the first 10 minutes who like finds out the master plan and tries to run and give it to Jason, like in the subway. And then like, right before I give it to him, like the, the sniper kills me. And I'm like, ah, so close. But I, but I feel like maybe I'd live, I'd go to the coma. I feel like Jared's the guy who warns everyone, publishes it, writes a book, like literally gives you the memo. And then like, he's seen as a crazy person and killed. <laughs> I cannot wait to get together with him. And have you explained that plot? He is going to be dead at the end of that. Metaphorically. Oh, that is hilarious. But don't you see him as a guy who goes, I'm telling you, everybody, this is how it goes down. I'm telling you. They're like, that crazy Jared. He's uh, riding, he he and like Sarah Kenzie are riding on, on like some white stallion, sorry, into yeah. town screaming, the British are coming, except it's the Russians or whatever. And they're screaming and they've got sirens and they're ringing bells. And then you come running in kind of like, like a, looking like a poor Oliver Twist, like Muslim kid. And you're yeah. also screaming, but not on a white horse because you can't be because you're not white. Yeah, you know, you know what? Yeah, exactly. And what happens? The only reason I live is because they're like, no darkies allowed. I'm like, what? And they're like, they stop me from coming in and then they shoot Sarah and Jerry. But no, actually, you- I'm glad you mentioned Sarah because all these like, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday without bitterness. You know, Atlantic's publishing a lot of good articles. You had Robert Kagan, a neocon in Washington Post with that viral article like last yeah. month. Yeah. And I sat there and I'm reading these articles warning us about warning about the end of democracy. And even the this latest one that went viral in Atlantic, which is a big piece, the author himself admits that he was wrong. He got it wrong. Right. And I sit there and I think I'm like, man, me, Sarah, especially Jared, especially all the people of color, man, for three or four years. Like, wh- why does it take a-, a wrong white dude for America to listen? But whatever, man, if it, that's what it takes. Well, I I generally wait till all the people of color are screaming so loud that their voices are gone. And then I just wait for Josh Marshall and Chris Hayes to tell me what's what. <laughs> and then and I like, know. Josh, Josh is a good egg. I know Chris- they both are, but it's like they're, you know, who was it yesterday was kind of complaining about this. Liz Winstead was like about abortion. She's like, do you know, I've got no voice left. I've been screening and warning about this. And now these guys jump on board and they start saying it. And they're like, well, can you believe it's happening? And she's like, yes. 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 Women have been warning for years, for years. <clears throat> what do you think about that Supreme court case argument last week? I think they're going to kill it. I think uh, it's a man. It reminds me so much of that classic. I mean, I've, I've, I've used some exquisite pop cultural references. So uh, I'll land on this one with the Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown sits there and tells Lucy, are you sure you're not going to lift the football this time? She goes, I'm not. Why don't you want to try to kick it? And each and every single time, right when he's about to kick it, she pulls the football and he falls on his ass. Right. <laughs> I feel like that's the Democrats in the in the majority in this country, because remember, the, like Susan Collins, who was just a clown. But she's like, we asked, you know, he assured us. Of course, Amy Barrett and Kevin, all these people, quote unquote, gave assurances. But it's all bullshit. If you saw if you literally took their words and I take these people literally and seriously, Roe is dead. And what they're going to do is basically neuter Roe, but give it enough of a of like a, a, a comatose life to say that they didn't kill it. And they're going to punt it to the states. And then the states are just going to kill it. And then now you're going to have women uh, essentially, you know, going to the, the alleyways using hangers. And it's going to affect poor white women, poor black women, poor native women and poor Latino well, women. And the rich the rich whites will get to go to Aspen. For their abortion. Oh, that's for sure. What do Muslims think about abortion? Is there a wide range of opinion on it? Yes and no. Uh, we're not as nutty. Uh, it was, for most of us, it's like, if you've noticed, we're never the ones like leading uh, alongside, like, you know, the evangelical Christians, even on gay marriage, right? 
for us, it's kind of like do your own thing privately, but also for abortion, it's uh, in case of like rape or death, you save them, save the mom's life. You abort the baby. And also for traditional opinion, you have up to the first three months. Uh, and also then if you do abort, it's one of those situations where it's like looked down upon, but we're not obsessed with this. It's kind of those situations you keep it private. Uh, traditional ruling is you have up to the first three months, if possible, then afterwards try to you know keep the baby. If it's the health risk to the mom or rape and incest, enough scholars have said, you know, you can get rid of the baby, but it doesn't really animate us. It's really interesting. Like it does not like hijack our mindset the way it does of the white evangelical Christians and white Catholics in this country. And we don't give a shit about the funny thing is in this country is we love babies as soon as they're in the room. As soon as that baby comes out, it's like pull yourself up from the bootstraps. <laughs> yeah, baby is the is a lazy baby. Yeah, lazy piece of shit, baby. <laughs> I, I, baby is so look at that baby over there. Just sitting there. Yeah, useless. Useless. What what what, what is that baby? Code, baby? Learn to code. What <laughs> why do I have to pay for that baby's health care? Dude, you know we're the only or uh, industrialized country that does not guarantee paid parental leave. Yeah, it's crazy. Every time, every time I say we hate mothers and kids, people are like that's very harsh. So I'm like, we I, don't all guarantee paid parental leave, and I, we have the highest maternal uh, mortality rate of like industrial countries. And if you don't have healthcare, it's the most expensive country to have a kid around thirty one thousand dollars. There's um forget like minorities and lower income folks or whatever. Like there are so many like pretty middle class, upper middle class, affluent 30 year old white people that have one kid find out how much preschool is. It's That's more, right. it's more than their mortgage. And they legitimately, this is like a document. I think I read this in the Atlantic, the data, you may have seen it. They're like, we can't have another kid. We can't afford preschool for two kids. And these are rich whites. These are well yeah. off. You know, these are my wife and I, when, when our, when our kids went to preschool, I mean, this shit is expensive as hell, but you pay for it if you have the money because you know how important it is and it allows you to work and you might make a little more money than you're paying out. But it's not true of most. We're not even talking about lower income people. Forget about well, race. Forget about any of that. Class, upper middle class, suburban parents, because people realize child care is about as expensive as me working. So why yeah, don't you be the right. breadwinner and I'll just stay home yep. for the first four or five years. And then as we're talking about this, for those of you who want to watch my TED Talk, my TED Talk was about the case for having children, but it was actually a Trojan right, horse right. to basically talk about pronatal policies because every year now since I've, that, I've done that TED Talk, it was about two and a half years ago, Elon Musk, who's getting nuttier and nuttier, is now telling people to have more kids because all the right-wing folks in this country are like, these lazy young folks aren't having kids and are, you know, our total, uh, uh, repl- uh, the total fertility rate has dropped to 1.7 you're supposed to have 2.1 average kids per mom to the, just just to replace the previous generation so we're at 1.7 the lowest ever it means we're not having enough kids and people are like oh my god china's not having enough kids japan eu us this will be catastrophic for our economy people are living older our social security the benefits like it's just going to be a mess so have more kids but then young people are, forget young people even like like you said us us folks were like i would love to have more kids i can't afford it it's not worth it uh, yeah, I can't yep. afford to have kids. Yep. There's no pre parental leave. There's no free pre K. Uh, my job doesn't pay me enough. F it. Yep. Yep. Totally. And everybody's like so many people making that decision. And I'm going to have to let you go in a minute here. Um, can we talk about, um, can we talk about Chris Cuomo? Yes, let's do it. Did you have a relationship with him? Chris was always good to me as a host, uh, responsive, treated me with respect, enjoyed me having coming on a show, used me a lot. Uh, I never saw anything when it comes to the sexual harassment uh, or sexual misconduct allegations. That being said, after I had left uh, CNN, I saw the Chris and Andrew show, right? Remember, this was when Chris was at home. He had, he got COVID. Andrew Cuomo was still beloved because, you know, he was the New York mayor taking on Trump's policies. And, you know, that Governor, segment, yeah. maybe once, maybe twice is enough. But that became a recurring segment. And it's seeing that made me very uneasy because I'm like, there should be a firewall. Chris has the highest rated show on CNN. He's a cable news host, but also considers him as a reporter. He's very close to his brother. His brother is the freaking governor of New York. And Zucker, I'm sure, said, oh, this is good ratings. So let's do this yuck, yuck, older brother ribbing on the younger brother. That's what it was, right? It made us feel really uncomfortable. Now, you know, you find out that Chris was said he was open and said, it's my brother. I'm going to help him. Fine. That I think was wrong. He should have been suspended for that. 
But then when the New York attorney general releases treasure trove of information, it was beyond that, man. He was crafting narrative and strategy yep. and working with yep. the aides and using his immense privilege to hunt down scoops and essentially, let's be honest, try to dig up dirt on the female accusers. That, I think, was the line. And he should have been fired for that last week. And I think apparently it came to the sexual harassment allegation yeah. from the previous employee when he worked at ABC that finally did it. But it just goes to show you, the last thing I'll say on this, is who gets the second pass? Who gets the slap on the wrist? And who gets fired? Reza Eslans gets fired because he calls Trump a shithead and Trump then calls Zucker and says, you got to yeah. get rid of Reza. Uh, Octavia Nasser gets thrown under the bus for a comment on Israel. Mark Lamont Hill gets thrown under the bus. And Curry gets thrown under the bus. Who gets protected? Matt Lauer. Chris Cuomo. That, to me, is the bigger story. Well, you just named the expendables. Yeah, yeah. XD, and they come back 30 years later uh, with good credit. <laughs> and, you know, by the way, you said, you know, it, the, the whole Andrew Cuomo, Chris Cuomo talking about COVID and, and everything made you uncomfortable, it, it, for sure. You know, you know who made um, a lot of people uncomfortable is uh, Andrew Cuomo alone. <laughs> That guy well, was like, such a fucking predator, man. Like, really fucked up, dude. Like, yeah, and, he, and that's the thing people don't realize. This is like very credible sexual yeah. misconduct allegations. Like, this is like, this is sleazy stuff. Weird shit. Yeah. I mean, listen. Power, man, power. That's the thing. Power gets to you. Yeah. And of course, then people say this. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, people on the left or people who aren't Republican, they say, well, well, the liberals, I mean, the Republicans get away with it. There's no bar with the Republicans, right? Like, like, they'll get away with everything. They don't care. Like, Bill O'Reilly, consistently, like... like well, it doesn't... It, 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 it's just a stupid thing. You have a value, you have a moral line. It doesn't matter what go. someone's political ideology is. If my friend... Well, it's different. You're my friend. It's a bad example. But, like, if someone is a Democrat or a liberal, Republican or conservative, it doesn't matter if they murder somebody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're lying. It doesn't matter if they're dishonest it doesn't matter it's just you have a principle it doesn't there you go. i mean it's and not and i think based on the principle and the sad part is for you and me the standard and the principle should have been enough to let him go yeah the reason why they let him go is because it made cnn and zucker look bad and enough people and the rumors say that's tapper and others said that this is enough you yeah. have to get rid of us you have to get rid of cuomo that's the sad part that it was bad for appearance and optics yeah no to just be What's your standard? And then like Jeffrey Tubin is out there still doing his thing. He got a six month like slap on the wrist. And yeah. can you imagine if a woman just started like did what he did? I don't know, man. Or a person of color did it. I just don't. I a don't woman, see a woman would never masturbate accidentally on a Zoom call. This, this is true. Also, I apologize, women. You're the superior species. I mean, like, far smarter than us and actually have decency. But men were like, oh, <laughs> oh I, got, I got six minutes. Let's go. <laughs> Look, we look at our watches. We look around and see if there's any cameras or mics, and then we yeah, uh, we take care of biz. I smell the rose. It got a little stiff. <laughs> uh, the kids are away. What should the I do? The kids are away. Is the Wait, only... we're like, yo, let me meditate. Let me do yoga. Yeah. Let me take a nap. Uh, uh, let me like research things I need to get for the home. No, because can you... that's what I have to do. Men are like, ooh, ooh, let no, me I just... mean, like, like, can you imagine? Like, forget about it. We're we're giving women too much credit, but like, can you imagine like a female like? journalist that we could even like hypothetically name like I'll say Laura Coates because she's one of my best friends and she doesn't mind me making fun of her imagine if like Laura Coates did something scandals you'd be like she would never even <laughs> she would be so it. smart yeah you can't even imagine it you would, you could imagine Laura telling someone else not to do it yeah <laughs> Laura. Like, hey, hey, Jeff, Laura. Jeffrey, Jeffrey hey, hey Jeffrey put Jeffrey. your dick away Jeffrey. Jeff Jeff, Jeff. Jeff. Away. She, you can imagine her texting him yeah. Jeff, you're on mute, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But you uh, like men are like, huh? Huh? Exactly. Uh, no, that's that's the thing. That's my takeaway from the Cuomo's is we need a standard. It has to be consistent. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry to say this as the darky Muslim guy who always plays the race card as the race hustler. Imagine if a woman or a person of color did it. Would they get the benefit of the doubt? And because he's good ratings and he's a Cuomo and he has access, man, he got away with a lot. Yeah. I've been thinking about, I mean, like Imagine if women of color, or someone of color did blank is like the, it's like this, they should name our generation that the, this week or last week, this kid, you know, kills four classmates Promise. and, 
and his dad bought him a pistol the week before and Tim Wise was on and he's like, do you, granted we're two white guys talking, but he's like, do you think black parents buy their sons pistols to bring, like, what? Like, this yeah. is a white pathology. And if a Muslim, sure. like, if a brown person, did, like, this motherfucker, this kid made an, a, a clock. He made a clock, this Muslim kid. Yeah, he's and like, Berlin, Berlin guy brought a clock and it was ticking. And that's why they brought the, like, law enforcement. And they're like, all right, all right, listen, this this clock. It goes back. Everything comes full circle. The suitcase, right? No, think about it. The, the demonization of Muslims and why it impacts us, the treatment of Ilhan, why am I more concerned, is because Ilhan becomes the avatar and stand-in for the rest of us. Yes. Muslim woman, black, first a refugee, right? She's the trifecta uh, of all the boogeymen of the right wing. And so the way they attack her, normalize it, mainstream it, means that's what they think about us. And it goes back to the backpacks. It goes to Emma the clock boy. And meanwhile, this kid, Ethan Crumbly, was radicalized by his parents. Just look at the 2016 open letter. I'm sure you discussed it with Tim, where the mom, you sit there and you go, holy crap, this is a sneak preview of the future of the GOP. Yeah. It's like it's like an exquisite snapshot of what's going to happen. Where literally they're warning the parents and the parents are like, just don't get caught next time when you're scrolling for ammo. Oh, you found this really dangerous notes, which seems like he's going to commit violence. We're not going to pick him up. Keep him at school. And right when they kept him at school, he goes in, takes out the gun and kills four people. And then as he's killing four people, this country hates kids so much that there's a video of kids escaping through the window yeah. with their masks on. Yep, I saw that. I saw that. But back to the kid with the alarm clock. He, <laughs> he, that kid. <laughs> that kid. I mean. That we caught him. It could have gone tick, tick, boom. Did, didn't Obama like invite him to White House? I'm like, uh, sorry, I'm real sorry. <laughs> Yeah, NASA did. NASA was like, uh, you right. want a job or like something or like, uh, sorry, buddy. He's like NASA's like, that's pretty amazing. You made this clock. And then like the right wing is like, it wasn't that impressive of a clock. No, no. The right is now, uh, you know, authoring, uh, offering Rittenhouse literally an internship and defending Crumbly's parents. Like, listen, you know, and it's just like, but the point of view, Tim Wise's point was the whole you know, take a look at white pathology. Absolutely. Man. I mean, last question. Do you think, and I said this on another person's show, as these you. crumblies are going to get, uh, well, they're going to get convicted and sentenced most likely, will they become martyrs and heroes for the GOP like the McCloskeys, Eddie Gallagher, and Kyle Rittenhouse? No, but it's because, only because their last name is Crumbly, and it's so fun, and they're so, it's so, it sounds so harmless, and I think it's like a John uh, Candy <laughs> move here, like, <laughs> The Crumbly's Christmas. Who's afraid of Harry Crumbly? Nobody. That's an old school reference. Yeah. Who's yeah. Afraid of Harry Crumb? yeah. But, no, but you know why? Because they're going to go after parents' rights. So right. I, mean, I may be more cynical than most, but I think you will see a campaign to, in a way, uh, make these folks seem like martyrs, just like they did with Ashley Babbitt, who was radicalized. Right. And came yeah. Blood. No, it's it's not too far fetched. Yeah. That's where we are, man. It's but a great place to be. But at least, at least, you know, as long as a Muslim doesn't have a backpack, we'll be okay. I'm glad I'm here with you. No, man, this is great. I, that we stayed overtime, but it went fast. Thank and you. And people should know that me and Pete, uh, Pete never tells me what we're going to talk about. That's what's so cool about it. We just sit and riff. Wajad Ali, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me, as always, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there he goes, Wajad Ali on Twitter. Read him at the Daily Beast. Go get his book. Let him know that you heard him here on the show. He will see your tweets and appreciate it. And now it's time to get to my second guest of the program. He's a longtime regular, uh, and I always love talking to him about all things, well, pretty much about anything. We've become good friends over the years. He is a Middle East analyst, an author, a negotiator, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he hosted a great panel on Joe Biden, the administration's democracy summit, which is, a, is an interesting adventure that we talked a little bit about. He is on Twitter, by the way. He's also a great author, I should mention. He's written several books, but check him out on Twitter. He's a great follow at Aaron D. Miller 2, the number two, Aaron D. Miller 2. And we start with a little bit of a personal question that I was asking him, and then I just hit record. So here we go. Aaron David Miller. How old are your kids now? Jenny's 40 uh, and Danny's 38. You gained so much wisdom through your life and through your work. Did you... 
did you like regularly impart that wisdom to your kids through like conversation or role modeling both? I mean, I think it was more or less unconscious, un- unconscious role model. I mean, yeah, we, we, both Lindsay and I imparted on them a, a few, well, people give their kids all kinds of advice, but the important pieces of advice actually were only two, I think. Number one, whatever else you do in this world, make sure that you leave it a better place than when you found it. Mm. And that largely means, you know, tethering yourself to whatever you do, butcher baker, candlestick maker, that whatever you do is larger than just yourself. In other words, you turn the M and me upside down. So it's a W and we. And the other piece of advice is the happiest people we both know professionally, not personally, that's another whole matter. Professionally are those who combine passion and expertise. They love what they do. And they know what they're talking about because passion without expertise can be dangerous and expertise without passion can be unbelievably boring. <laughs> and they, they both took that and I applied it to my own life. And I think for better, or for worse, I mean, it's just true. Did your kids, because you're an expert in foreign policy and you worked for the state department and you traveled, I would imagine all over the world and you negotiated and you you all knew all the diplomats and stuff. Do your kids then end up caring about things outside their community, much less their their borders? Because I feel like that's like these issues are, are hard to get our kids these days. I'm not sure that they ever did necessarily because kids are, are young and, and confused and self-centered, especially now, maybe more than I don't know. Did your kids pick up an interest in foreign? Well, they both did. My 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 daughter's first book, Inheriting the Holy Land, one one America's one American search for peace in the Middle East was a direct result. Her, she's written four or five books. Most she writes fiction now, but this was a nonfiction book. She developed an interest in it because of my interest. But on her own, she she also through a nonprofit Seeds of Peace got to know Israeli and Palestinian kids, Indians, Pakistanis, and decided to you know to write a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through the eyes of young people. So she spent a year in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza doing research, and I helped her interview just about everybody, from Arafat to Netanyahu. But she rapidly and quite rightly soured on not only in the Middle East, but I think on foreign policy generally, and began to write fiction, but also to devote herself to the dysfunction that is occurring here. My son you know, went to live in Cairo, got pretty good Arabic, came back. And now he, again, he has an interest in foreign policy in the world. They both do. But his work is largely in democracy promotion and trying to fix what ails the republic. And I must say, both of them are in deep despair over what's happening here. As are you, it's my understanding. I am. I am. But I, because I saw America with all its imperfections actually work for a time, you know, roughly from the end of the Second World War to the early 80s, when in fact our our political culture was more functional, middle class had some hope of advancement. You could really literally think about um, your kids having a better life than you, than you had. I, I still cling to that, and they're very frustrated with that because they they rightly believe I... I'm not as acutely worried about how bad things really are. And I don't, because of my attachment to this other America, I don't really understand how, how, what a critical inflection point we now face. Let me ask you just because today is December 7th, uh, Pearl Harbor invasion of Pearl Harbor and basically what got America into World War II. People are asking this silly, you probably think it's, I think it's kind of a silly question, but like, what if that happened to us today? Maybe it's not, maybe you don't think it is. It's hard to, it's hard to look at, but I kind of was thinking about how much sacrifice every American seemed to have made to be on the, on the same side. And before the invasion, apparently, you know, most Americans were completely opposed to foreign war, especially wars in Europe after World War One. 
And then after the invasion, obviously that changed minds and opinions and FDR led and so on. But now it would seem that the big effort we need every American to do is get vaccinated and we'll even bring the vaccine to your house and you don't even have to get up and and people don't want to be patriots by by that definition to fight a virus that's killed almost a million Americans, probably has killed past a million Americans. Hard to know. What, what are your thoughts on on that, you know, kind of hypothetical question if Pearl Harbor were invaded today, given the divisive nature of America? You know, I, I, I sometimes think that had had the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor with either a Democratic or Republican administration, that we would have had a very difficult time. Uh, mobilizing and marshalling the resources that were actually required. Remember, this, the Second World War was the only war 80 years on that left the United States stronger at home and stronger abroad. And in large part, that was driven certainly by leadership, but it was also driven by a sense of selflessness and willingness to sacrifice without a lot of questioning. I mean, it, it's almost hard to imagine anyone in 1941. I talked to my my father-in-law last week, or a week before we went home for Thanksgiving. He's a hundred now. Wow! Completely lucid. He served, and I asked him, "You served?" He said, "Of course I served. I could not think." He said, "Of missing it, the notion of of not being a part of this was simply." Not acceptable. I think societal pressures, partly, but also people needed and wanted to be a part. I mean, 130 million Americans in 1941, 12 million of them that put on a uniform. It's extraordinary to imagine such a thing. It, now, it, that's not to, there, there's a new book out, I forget by whom, on, on the gauzy way in which we now look at World War II and the greatest generation. But nonetheless, I mean, you can't argue with with reality. That was an extraordinary demonstration of American will, skill, power, and resources. There were a lot of downsides. Segregation of the of the military, uh, Roosevelt's executive order imprisoning Japanese Americans. Uh, you know, probably the worst thing Roosevelt did during his many administrations. So I, I don't want to, I'm not here to over nostalgize the past. America has, uh, w- one of the things that changed for the better is rights have expanded in a way that I, I found remarkable. Um, but so much has been lost in large part because it's hard to imagine a country grieving together. It's hard to imagine a country celebrating together now. It's hard to imagine a a truly popular president. Yeah, that transcends both party parties uh, and the kind of tribalization of American politics. I don't. It's despairing. One of the one of the reasons I was so depressed during the last four years with Donald Trump. Is that I, well, there were Americans, Pete, who, for whom the last president they saw in their lives was Donald Trump. To me, that thought was so crushing. Yeah. That if my final moments were spent after my own career thinking about the future of this country with a man like that, at its helm, it was demoralizing. I think about that uh, quite a bit. I think specifically about John Lewis and Elijah Cummings. Yeah. Um, and and any other American, certainly those who had fought in World War II and fought Nazis, especially. Um, but, but, you know, I was watching your series that you hosted at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, uh, Carnegie Connects, which is great. Check out their YouTube channel. And, and you hosted a conversation between two Excellent scholars, Francis Brown, Dr. Francis Brown, Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld, uh, uh, titled Democracy in Peril. And, and, and they made the points about how Putin's Russia, Putin and Russia certainly have done all they can to drive a deep wedge into what is already divisive issues here in America using 
social media, and we all know a bit about that. And to me, that's the difference between between a World War II situation. Like if it were Pearl Harbor, we would have seen propaganda right away saying, oh, that it wasn't Japanese planes or something. And I say that because we all saw January 6th on our TVs, and they are all trying to rewrite what that was right now. That's not even a year old. So given Russia's efforts and other nations as well in terms of trying to create that digital propaganda that exploits the hell out of our already standing uh, divisiveness, that that would be where we're at. That's where we're at today, it would seem. Yeah. And I think the two most worrisome trends to me uh, uh, is what Rand calls, Rand Corporation calls truth decay. The notion that millions of Americans fundamentally disagree with other millions of Americans on basic empirical realities. And if there's no common perception of the truth, and I don't, when I say the truth, I don't mean some philosophical, you know, ethical issue to debate. But when empirical reality is up for grabs, as it is today, then that leaves the door wide open for somebody, a he or she, to ride in with their own version and their own definition of the truth. And that is the incipient phase and stage of real authoritarianism. I, I interviewed Madeleine Albright on one of the on one of my early Carnegie Connects this fall. And her favorite quote from Mussolini <laughs> is that if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, Nobody notices. Yeah. And that's what's that's, you know, I don't believe that we're on the cusp of turning into, you know, a totalitarian society. I, I, I don't believe that's possible in this country. But the trends of that of truth decay, because you can't have effective self-governance if a full third of the country is operating on a set of empirical facts fundamentally different. Right. All right. And then second problem, and I raised it today, to me, the greatest problem with this, in terms of the democracy recession here is the mainstreaming of not just violent, of political violence, but the fact that, and again, I voted for Republicans and Democrats and worked for them, that you have one party that has become an, anti, an anti-American system party. And it it mainstreams and validates all of this. That's almost un, almost unprecedented in the way that it's being done. I mean, Rachel Kleinfeld made the point that the Democratic Party for a century was the party of segregation and the use of force, in, the, in, in particularly in the South after the Civil War, to repress African American suffrage. And now you've got a Republican Party that seems incapable of untethering itself from these fantasies and, of course, from the shadow, the very real shadow that's looming over our whole political process still. Yeah. And I talk with people about Donald Trump's impact. Is he going to fade? Is he not going to fade? Is he not going to fade? The reality is what he's left behind is a, is a, is a ticking bomb. Right. You know, you reference the Freedom House and their democracy scores. How, how do you how do you experts, you PhDs of, of, of foreign policy and diplomacy and history, uh, evaluate the health of a democracy? You guys are talking about everybody's talking about this summit led uh, by the president of the United States, Joe Biden. He campaigned on creating such a summit. It's virtual. It's 100 leaders. We can debate whether you know, who who got the invitations and who RSVP'd, et cetera, who should be there, who deserves to be there. How how do we evaluate and how good of a evaluator is Freedom House, what a healthy democracy in the world looks like? I mean, I think they do a pretty good, good survey. The Economist's Intelligence Unit ranks democracies. VDEM, a Swedish nonprofit, does it as well. You know, it's it, it it's a complicated process. And it involves all sorts of indices. And by the way, word, way I hate the word expert. I I really do. I I be. I mean, I I could. We could talk for another ten minutes on why that's the case. People devote their entire lives to the study of democratic governance and what constitutes a, a democracy. I'm not. 
I'm not an expert in this, but I, I think it's clear, you know, when you've got um, a situation in which a an election is contested and contested in the streets, when you have voting restrictions that are in, increasingly imposed by law, when you we are when you are now criminalizing voter structure if it's not handled in the precise way that a particularly uh, a Republican legislature wants it to be handled, when you have this truth decay, you know you're creating headlines and trend lines that are creating real dysfunction in in governance. And you know Rachel pointed out that some states are behaving in as arbitrary a fashion as some liberal democracies around the world. So federalism, which is the nature of our system, can be a blessing as well as a liability. Right. If you look around the world uh, in terms of the, the world's rising autocracies, however you want to, whatever words you want to use, authoritarians, dictators, you see how media is used in the history and, and now from, you know, World War One, the Civil War. I mean, all the way up through Rwanda, the radio uh, uh, personalities who, who created a, a genocide there. I, I see that, I, you know, we talk so much about government. It seemed like that's so much of what your panel talked about today. And I always feel like the, the media element is left out of it. And what is journalism and what is truth? And the other night, Tucker Carlson of Fox News going on and saying that Alex Jones is a more as a better journalist than, you know, CBS's Margaret Brennan or whoever else he wants to pick. I mean, we're right. turning and it's and, and it's being led by Tucker Carlson and Alex Jones and Fox News and other major right wing media outlets. They are leading these Republicans in the House and Senate and at the state houses and at the think tanks. And I feel like that gets left out because it seems so difficult to evaluate or, or to change, because all you got to do is be popular. Well, but without again, and I, I, I come down, I, I, I come down here. Uh, everything. I mean, I agree with the destructive nature of all of the individuals you mentioned. But I also ask myself the question: You know, how much responsibility should fall on us to listen, to decide what makes sense, what doesn't, what is fantasy, and what's reality? And this is what disturbs me the most. I'm, I, I still wonder why people believe this stuff. Well, what is it? What is it that pushes them to do it? Is it economic grievance? Is it loss of identity? Is it fear of being replaced? I mean, what is it that leaves people open to this sort of hateful, polarizing language? Why can't people who have the rest, all of us, who all have the ability with a with a movement of a mouse to access more information without ever leaving your house in an effort to identify what actually makes sense and what doesn't so to a large degree i i i, I mean I, I don't want to give any of them a pass but a, a lot of the responsibility has to fall on the citizenry i mean let me give you an example in in 1962 during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Jack Kennedy gave an hour-long speech. I was 12, I think, at the time. The, the networks, after he finished speaking, went back to normal programming. Think about it. There, were, there was no analysis. You didn't have six journalists on three major networks and I don't know how many cable outlets. No social media. Analyzing telling people what this speech meant. My parents had to listen to Jack Kennedy for an hour at the height of the greatest, the greatest threat of nuclear war that this country and the world has ever faced and decide for themselves whether what Kennedy had to say made sense. I, we've, the media has mediated. It has gotten in between humans and accessing information and knowledge to come to conclusions that somehow make sense. Well, there's a lot of money in that. There is a lot of money in it. And so, you know, and it's, it's also, it's also entertainment. 
Well, sure. We, we, I, I, we've contracted out our politics to Tucker Carlson. Yeah. To the talker, to the talking heads, to social media. I mean, I, 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 I must say, I do not use Facebook. I do use Twitter largely as an element of self promotion. Um, but I, I don't. I mean, Twitter is not a reflection of reality. I, it, 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 people say that all the time, and I tend to agree, but it certainly does influence and shape reality. Yeah. You and know, the question the, is why? Be, well, tribalism? I, I, and, and, I, I, and, don't ha- I don't have an answer. Why, why, yeah. aren't peop- why, why can't people think for themselves? How, how can they be influenced by ideas that many of them probably believe make no sense? And yet... You know, why do people believe in God? It's because for many people, God works. God serves a purpose. And the media serves a purpose. It fills a, it fills a need in people's lives to rant, to rave. I, I, I mean, otherwise, I don't, it's hard for me to explain. Don't you think it helps, for example, you know, someone who has come up on hard times, a working class person who is, you know, worked pretty hard their whole life and, and just can't seem to get ahead. And what a lot of media narratives do is they, they help that person understand why they're in the situation that they're in. It gives them someone to blame, something to blame. And, and it becomes very tribal. It becomes very psychological and it becomes very... I think self-fulfilling to some extent. You've always got kind of somebody else or something else to blame. And and you may very well, but it's often the wrong thing that they're feeding people. Or it's or it's the or or they've tapped into a legitimate source of anger and frustration, but are using it for illegitimate purposes. Right. They've tapped into a legitimate grievance, but they're giving them an illegitimate uh narrative or source for their to 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 direct their their anger at I would and, and an object to direct their right anger. a person yeah, often. I, mean, I, I don't think there's any question about it and i think you know the, the as much as there's a symmetry between democrats and republicans in terms of the uh damage i think they're doing to the country largely on the republican side the democrats also have their own problems in terms of who's controlling the messaging for the democratic party and is it in fact working? Well, and I don't. I mean, I I think it's not working, and uh, I worry. I worry about that too. Well, just give me your your take. You wrote a piece. You talked about it at. Uh, you wrote a piece at the Washington Post, uh, and you talked about it today at Carnegie Connects. And and as we as we close here, I just want to get your thoughts on on the objective this effort. Hopefully, we hear a lot about this. Uh, world diplomacy t- uh, conference. It's all virtual. It's like a hundred nations. And you wrote a nuanced piece about it. Tell me your, your thoughts on on the effort. And, and I think basically what you say in this piece, along with your colleague Richard Sikulski, uh, Sikulski is that uh, you think maybe they're they're aiming a little too high. Maybe they should have lowered their expectations. Yeah, I mean the real the real question is whether or not we are still. I think by and large we are still in a position to lead. Right. We are one of the two world's largest democracies, but but uh, together with India, but we've seen a precipitous decline in both India and uh, and with respect to the United States in terms of democratic pra- practice. We live in a glass house, right? And right. in my, it was my it's my view that Biden should go smaller abroad, much more focused in cooperating with fellow democracies on discrete specific issues. Uh, and go big at home. But when, if you ask me what it means to be big, go big at home, we run up against a brick wall. Because what we really should be doing is passing legislation with respect to voting rights. Yes. And that's, that's DOA, unfortunately. I mean, I, I will read to you, because I think it's, it's really to close out, in, in 1838, Lincoln gave a speech to the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield. Here's what he said. At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth in their military chest with a Bonaparte as a commander could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. Hmm. 
At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Mm. Okay? I've seen the enemy, and it's us. Yeah, yeah. And if I, to, just to close, if Biden were, on, were, were here today, he would say, there's no foreign policy issue out there that's more dangerous or damaging to the future of the republic than the three or four internal challenges and crises that we face at home. Those are the ones that need to be addressed. Yeah. Aaron David Miller, a pleasure, as always, to have you join me in, in the shed. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks. You're looking great, and so is the shed. <laughs> I appreciate it. All-, All right, there he goes, Aaron David Miller. Give him a follow on Twitter, and thank you very much, Aaron. Always a pleasure talking to that guy. So smart. He knows so many people. He's been around and seen it all, so I love talking to him. Read his books as well. And now I've got a very special thing to share with you because I just love when listeners collaborate and, and, and add, submit ideas to the show, whether it's a guest idea or a song idea or a segment idea or a jingle. I mean, every day Pete Coe is, is producing stuff for the show. Today we heard from Gareth Sever, who is so great. But listeners are often meeting each other and doing stuff with each other and collaborating. And I just love highlighting any of there's so many talented, creative people out there listening. Dr. Barry Hummel is one of them, and he is a a great, great guy, lives down in Florida, and he's the co-founder of a foundation, a quick doc is what it's called. And he's been instrumental in developing tobacco awareness and prevention programs for children and teenagers in Florida. So if that's not enough, he's a marathoner, he's a photographer, and he hosts a podcast with his daughter, Abigail, where they talk about music and beer. It's called Pops on Hops, Pops on Hops Pod dot com. Check it out. But I got a little sample to play for you because Barry Hummel reached out to Pico and commissioned him to write a jingle and then surprised his daughter, who he co-hosts the, po- uh, the podcast with. I can't speak here at the end. And he emailed and shared it to- with me. He said, I hired Pete Coe to create a short jingle for our Pops on Hops podcast. It addresses the fact that I have no sense of smell known medically as insomnia. And it's become a running gag on our podcast. I'm sorry to hear about that, Barry, but I love this. And I wanted to share it with everybody in case they want to start listening to Barry Hummel and his daughter, Abigail Hummel, talk about beer and music. Pops on hops. Here's a little sample where he worked with Pete Coe and surprised Abby. You know, the old school West Coast IPAs that have the very long aftertaste, the very long bitter aftertaste. By the way, I didn't get to ask you, were there any odors on the first two? (laughs) (laughs) I I didn't, because those big juicy things, I didn't. um... (coughs) Sorry, you made me laugh. Um, I didn't smell them. I'm sorry, is this an episode of Barry has an osmia? Do, 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 do. No, I could do better than that. <laughs> oh. What is that? That's the theme song to Barry Has an Osmia. Wait, play it again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where did you get that? That's my friend Pete Coe. Pete Coe wrote a jingle for you for an yeah, Well, yeah, I just said, I and I basically said I want you to sing an Osmia, and that's what he put together, so. Play it again. Anosmia. Is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Pete Coe, you are a genius. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I said to crowbar it in because it's the first time I've had it. That is so funny. Isn't that great? Is there more? No, it's short and to the point. I mean, do you have B, C, and D, Phil? Not yet. I wanted to test that, see what you thought of it before I commissioned anything that else. That is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Because I need heard. one for your height. I need one for... Um, <laughs> Abigail is short. I need... Uh, <laughs> what's the other one I had? I uh, had a third one that we always bring up. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to commission some additional jingles from my that friend Pete Cup. That is so, so funny. Great. I'm glad you like it. Well, this concludes Barry Has an Osmia. An Osmia. <laughs> <laughs> what a stupid thing i love it so much but i can only have four clips on this device i don't Uh, think we need more than that i don't know what about the 
Untap sponsor us. That's the other one. That's right. That's right. I have to commission them. I have to commission them. But I wanted to test that one first to see if it was worth my effort. Oh my gosh, Pete Co. God bless you, man. <laughs> Friend of the podcast, Pete Co. You can uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Pete Co. V O. Okay. Pete Covio. He's a voice art artist and musician. So please, please check go him follow him. Pete Covio. We'll put wow. that in the show notes. Yeah. Isn't that fun? That was very cool. That made my whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's two seconds and long. It's two seconds long. I don't know. There's something really special and sweet listening to a father and his daughter, his, his grown daughter, hanging out. And she's hilarious. Abigail is short. I love that. She's quick. She's funny. They're smart. And if you like beer and music and a dad talking to his daughter that are real smart and funny, Pops on Hops podcast. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. So I love the plug listeners, creative work. And I love when you guys are collaborating with each other. It's so, so great to be a thread that, that connects that. And I love having you in my life. So thank you to Barry and Abigail and Pete Coe and Garrett Sever and John Carroll, who all contributed to today's show. And thank you to you for listening all the way to the end. I love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye bye. That experiment, if you stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up, and raise your voice in every way you know how, don't be toes up, you got to show up, ain't no better time to do it but now, now no need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up, show up. To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide It says stand up